Welcome to a very special event, a tribute to Mr. Rahul Bajaj by his three children, Rajiv, Sanjeev, and Sunaina. Mr. Bajaj, as we all know, was a national icon, a public figure, the person behind Hamara Bajaj, and the chairman emeritus of the Bajaj Group. Today, his children will share special memories of him. And it's a very poignant moment, because we're here to discuss his book, which has been uh, written by my mother, Dr. Geeta Piramal. So I would like to introduce myself as a writer and a columnist, Aparna Piramal Raje, but really I'm here on my mother's behalf. So Rajiv, you are the managing director of Bajaj Auto, which is today one of, not one of, but the world's largest and most valuable scooter companies. Sunaina, you are a gallerist um, and director of the Kamal Nayan Bajaj uh, Gallery in Mumbai. And Sanjeev, you're the chairman and managing director of Bajaj Finserve. All three of you are keeping this legacy of Mr. Bajaj's life alive. So Rajiv, I'll start with you. You've worked with him for 30 years, you overlap. And you started off um, on the shop floor, on the, in manufacturing, which is something you wanted. But that was also perhaps something he wanted, to make sure that you understood the business from the ground up. What was it like? Take us back to that time. So I joined in 1990, December 1990. I don't think my father ever told me what to do. You know, uh, so if I chose to start work on the shop floor, uh, that was my choice. Um, I think the good thing was I had nothing in common with my father. Uh, he was trained as a lawyer. Uh, he had studied economics. He had been to business school. Uh, I did not have such an elegant education. I was a mechanical and manufacturing engineer. So I was a mechanic compared to uh, him, he was a manager. So if he was in the office, I was on the shop floor. If he dealt with numbers, I dealt with components. So we had a very complementary relationship, uh, you know. So um, I remember that uh, the first few years, the first five years specifically, that I really enjoyed applying everything I had learned. Uh, to the shop floor at Bajaj Auto. You know, there is nothing more gratifying for an engineer uh, than to be able to translate what you have learned into something that actually tangibly happens uh, with machines and components and motorcycles and things like that. And I would revel in um, uh, going to his office maybe twice, thrice a week and say to him, uh, you know, come with me, I have something to show you. Um, and to be honest, he was not a uh, product person or production person, uh, but he never said no. You know, he, he always went along with me, um, even if uh, in his safari suit, which was so trademark of him, yeah. uh, it, it was not very comfortable on the shop floor because it was hot and you know, stuff like that. But he always came with me and no matter how small uh, the improvement was, uh, he was always very appreciative of that, you know. So that is how uh, I started and that's kind of, I would say, my first working memory uh, of myself and my father. So I want to fast forward a little bit, Sanjeev, to you at Bajaj Finserv. Of course, people associate Bajaj Auto very clearly with Mr. Bajaj. But for you, um, what was the role that he really played in getting this business, which has become so successful now? It was sometime around 2005, I was very much in Bajaj Auto running exports, where uh, a large number of outside in investors, well-wishers, uh, the media kept telling him that, you know, while you've got a large Bajaj Auto, you also have these budding companies in financial services, the two insurance companies at that time, Bajaj Auto Finance, that existed then, and saying that over a period of time, as these get bigger, um, it will get more difficult for us to value these businesses because they are all in one pot. Um, investors also said that, you know, some of us may want to just invest in the auto business, others in the financial services business. So why don't you break these up? And he used to say that, yeah, it's important, but not urgent. But in the background, a few of us started working in uh, uh, looking at uh, what the details would be for the demerger process. And in FY 07, 08, we underwent uh, the demerger process and created the financial services independent structure. Um, he was 
quite confident that uh, with India growing uh, in those years at 8, 9 percent, financial services would provide an interesting new opportunity. It took a while for him to get convinced because, you know, he was always focused on sticking to what he did best. Um, but over a period of time, he realized that uh, financial services could provide a good opportunity. I had worked 10 years at Bajaj Auto, it was getting to that. Uh, Raji was firmly in the saddle over there. And I saw this opportunity to take these companies, which had already existed, and build those out. So in many ways, it was this entrepreneurial rush that came in. Um, and because my father was not an expert in financial services, uh, he decided to ask uh, our uncle, Nanu Pamnani, who had only recently retired from Citibank, if he would mentor me, help us build the business. And, uh, and Nanu was more than happy to do so. So he found somebody who understood this world uh, very well and who was willing to give time and uh, be there behind us as we went out to build the business. And, uh, and that's how by end of 2007, I had moved to financial services to uh, start building it out. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty strategic move at the beginning to find a resource and somebody who could, you know, you would trust and who could build it out. I mean, have you find, found him doing these kind of calls all throughout in terms of building the businesses? Across the financial services businesses, um, the role that my father played was one, whenever in the initial years we interviewed senior people to hire, um, he interviewed them as well. And his style was very different. He used to tell them upfront that, you know, if you're sitting here um, across me, then everybody else has already asked you about your educational background, your experience, financial services. Uh, capabilities. Uh, my interest is to know how you will fit in over here. Will you fit into our culture? What are your values? Um, is, how is your family taking this decision? You need to move to Pune. Financial services, most people were in Mumbai uh, or uh, Delhi. Uh, but he brought in this very unique perspective into the interviewing process and he used to provide us with those insights which we had not thought of because we were just looking at these individuals for their capability and experience in helping us build business. In the same way, we used to quarterly, he was chairman of uh, these companies for many years, we used to quarterly take him through a very detailed review of how the business was doing. It typically went on for three, four hours or so with the top 20 people in the company presenting to him. And he had this ability to connect with each one of them. And uh, he also had this very interesting way where he used to go and pick up issues which were not necessarily something that we would have looked at from a financial services perspective, but which were often very relevant and made us think through again if uh, we were taking uh, the right decisions. And this is what my team used to tell me after the first year or two of reviews. Um, and I used to ask them, did you really want to attend this review? And people used to be very happy to be in those reviews. Where they said, first, his personal connect with each one of us is special. And second, he sometimes provides insights or he asks us those questions which the rest of you all have not asked us. So they used to enjoy those reviews as well. So this was his way of uh, adding value, of uh, being meaningful knowing very well that this was not his area of uh, professional expertise. Wow, so that's a really interesting learning for how you can actually have two consecutive successes, you know, when something that is in your domain area, and even as you said, Rajiv, it was not perhaps making vehicles, was perhaps not something that he, you know, grew up knowing about, um, and then getting into financial services. So ultimately, does it come down to really the values, the people, the culture, the, you know, the, the emphasis on certain things like he was the frugality that I've, that I've seen in, when I've interacted with both of you. Um, so is that what really differentiated him and made him so successful in both these two very different businesses? Either of you could. No, I don't think so. You know, I think, uh, of course, <clears throat> the culture, values and all of that is very important. But I think what really uh, defined him, and I think Sanjeev uh, referred to that, was his razor-sharp focus, you know, to do one thing at one time 
really well. You know, it's that 10,000 hours of expertise that people talk about now. And uh, I remember in those years, in the 90s, uh, ever so often we would hear him talk about uh, you know, how his friends would advise him to uh, diversify into one area or the other uh, because Bajaj Auto had been so successful, he had so much cash at his disposal, uh, he had a great reputation, uh, so why not do this and that and everything in between. And he was very clear, he said that, uh, you know, uh, diversification and fragmentation are two sides of the same coin. You know, a lot of people under the garb of de-risking are actually running a huge risk uh, of becoming the jack of all trades and master of none. And that in a very, very competitive marketplace, you will pay the price for that eventually. And that's happened, right? A lot of uh, so-called business groups that have stretched themselves across uh, different sectors uh, have gone nowhere really uh, with that, you know. So I think first and foremost, what was very important about him was his focus on excellence, on being world class, best in class, um, and putting every man, every minute, and every rupee behind that effort. And the second, yes, values, etc., important. I would say the word that describes it best is integrity, because so many times we heard him say, even at the end of an AGM speech, at the end of the day, I want to sleep well. If you want to add to yeah, that. no, no, I'll just add to that. These three points are make three clear points. Fourth was passion. Whatever he did, he only did if he was passionate about it. And uh, he used to tell me that at times. He said, uh, and I think he's told that to each one of us. He says, do whatever you're passionate about, but then try to be the best in what you do. The book is full of these one-liners. For example, he says that I'm ready to go to jail for excess production just as my parents went to jail for the freedom struggle. And there are lots of these. So did he have these kind of one-liners at home also? And uh, um, these? Well, there are a lot of his quotes about, uh, you know, uh, do what you want, but be the best at it, be passionate. Uh, you can't build uh, private heavens and public hell. I think that was so telling. And uh, the world needs more of a, a hybrid between a yogi and an entrepreneur. You know, there were so many of his these quotes and very often, when I'm doing something or thinking of something, it comes back to me. I'm always thinking of what he would do in a particular situation or what he would tell me to do or what he would expect of me, you know. And uh, so he was so right in, in the way he thought and the way he went about things. So these are things. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to talk about self-awareness and, you know, having that um, understanding of yourself as to what you stand for and what you represent and what you embody. And, and, and really having um, the stamina to stick to that and, and not, not change that. Um, I guess the reason I was asking that question also is really, could somebody who's much younger look to him and say, look, I want to be a Rahul Bajaj, right? So one of the things that my mother writes in the book is that he was a textbook leadership case, as you might see in a business school. But, you know, often what you see in a business school in a textbook is not what you see in the practice, but he was actually, you know, uh, living this um, in the corporate world himself. Now, Sanjeev, somebody as you, you've been to Harvard, he was one of the first people to go to Harvard Business School. Do you see that lessons in leadership that you think can be replicated by not just, you know, others from the outside who might want to see, but also people from your own family, the younger generation, who are also, who might want to get into the business? You know, what I found of him at work, actually it was true in everything he did. Um, one, he was always thoroughly prepared. He never left work till his table was clear. And he never went to bed till he was fully ready for the next day. Even if it was 400 pages of documents for a board meeting the next day, if it was for an event here to go and make a speech. So he was always thoroughly prepared. Second is, he could argue both points of view. And very often at work, that used to exasperate us because we had put forward a point of view. We knew this made sense. He would agree later on, but he had to put the other point of view also. Once he had evaluated what he thought were possible options and decided on one, he was very confident in how he um, went ahead and implemented that. And these are the typical things that we all learned in any good MBA school. But how he applied that? was not in any 
textbook that you can learn. Uh, it came through his own experience. It came through, uh, I think in his early years, he was born in 1938. He spent quite a few years in Varda. He saw what was happening with Gandhiji, the freedom struggle. At some level, that probably played a role. He used to tell us how his own father, uh, whenever he used to be in Pune, after dinner, the two of them used to sit for hours and talk about all, all kinds of issues. And my grandfather was, again, a very straightforward, bold person. There's an anecdote in the book where uh, in the late 60s, after Indira Gandhi starts nationalizing banks, a whole bunch of people from the Congress, including my grandfather, move away. And he tells my father, because he was chairman of most of our businesses, and he tells him that, you know, we could face uh, pushback from the government and your businesses could do that. And if you want to, I'm happy to step down as chairman and directors in all our companies. And my father said, no, uh, you should do what you think is right. And if we have to suffer that, we will do so. So I think somewhere implicitly, explicitly, those engagements with my grandfather and with others around through that freedom movement, and later on his own experience helped build his own unique character. And you think that unique character is something that you would hope to replicate in your life also? Or do you think that's possible? You know, you each one of us are different people. I'm not outgoing as he is. I listen before I talk. He used to talk, and but then he used to listen after that uh, as well. But certain common elements, courage in your conviction, integrity. As Rajiv said, integrity across. Uh, not just in what you're doing at work and you're taking decisions, but just integrity of thought. Hard work. But hard work also in ways as I think is relevant. My father, till a very long period, he used to check what time we punched our cards at work, morning, evening. And every couple of months, he used to take out those papers and tell us these were the days that you went late. So to him, in that manufacturing setup, it meant you had to be at work before the start of the shift and at the end of it. Uh, today, work is a lot more flexible. It has become virtual in the last few years. But yes, you work to what is required for uh, the responsibilities that you take. So that honesty about your work and transparency in what you do, these are the elements which uh, have stayed with me. Personalities, of course, we are each a different personality. So then uh, it's very clear in the book that your father was the patriarch and he held the family together. How did he do that when he had so many other demands on his time? And when I mean the family, I really mean the extended family as well. Yeah. So, you know, everyone, uh, when they think of Papa, they think of his aggressive, outspoken, uh, you know, determined, driven persona. But uh, I don't know if a lot of people realize, but he was very large hearted and very kind hearted. And for him, his greatest joy was people, his family, his friendships, his relationships. That meant a lot to him. And no matter how busy he was, he always made time for everybody. If anyone reached out to him, had an issue, wanted to talk, he would always give a time. No matter which country he was in, where he was, he always got back. And one thing I've seen of him is no matter how many emails he got a day, messages, emails, phone calls, he always returned them immediately or replied to all the emails. It would be some random emails from people who didn't even know, just the general random ones. But he would make it a point to reply to those also, which I don't think most of us do over here. But that's one thing I saw him do. So he was very much, for him, connecting with people, be it family, be it close friends, be it the larger, uh, you know, the country at large. I mean, people just randomly outside. It was very important to him, and he always made time for everybody, and we all felt that we could reach out to him anytime. He may not be able to talk that very minute, but he would definitely call back before end of the day or the next day at the latest. He had a list, and he was very clear, his PA knew, and he would always get back. So he, always, he also did a lot of holidays together. You know, he would drive them. Diwali was always together with the entire family, extended family. Uh, he would plan many trips. Uh, whenever he came to Bombay, where we were, we always had dinners organized. So he made sure he spent time with us that way, you know, wherever he could. I mean, these, I know my mother has been on some of these trips also and seen these relationships. Um, she also talks about in the book about how the relationships spilled across all aspects of business, government, society. And Rajiv, you referred to that also. Um, really, do you think this whole idea of business being a larger force 
you know, not just something that is about the capitalism for a particular individual of a particular family or looking at business as a larger force was something that he really represented. Would you agree with that? When I joined in the 1990s, um, <clears throat> at that time we were still in a situation where demand was much ahead of supply, you know. And uh, actually that was my opportunity because uh, sometimes machines would not work, sometimes the labor was not cooperative, sometimes suppliers failed us. Uh, but at the end of the day, we could not produce what we needed to. Uh, so, uh, along with a bunch of engineers, uh, if I could apply myself to that problem um, and improve productivity, let's put it like that, uh, that really helped the um, uh, company. Uh, so, at a particular point of time, there was a lot of resistance, uh, especially from the workmen, um, to these improvements in productivity because uh, the thought process always becomes that uh, if this is beneficial to the company, what is in it for me, uh, you know, and uh, what's the answer to that question. So I remember there was one say incident sometime in the 90s, I don't remember exactly when, uh, and this happened at the Aurangabad plant. And my uncle doesn't like my saying this, but in my opinion, Akudi was inefficient. Uh, Aurangabad was completely mismanaged, uh, you know. And uh, to get uh, that whipped into shape was a big task. Uh, but we were a determined lot of uh, young chaps. Uh, so we precipitated the issue. Uh, so there was resistance, there was violence, uh, and then there was a strike, uh, you know. And usually uh, at that time, and this was not just typical to Bajaj Auto, this was very typical of industry in general, usually one would uh, kind of, uh, in the name of finding a middle path, find a compromise, because one wanted the show to go on, right? The demand was there and you just needed to supply. But uh, I remember we had a Shiv Sena union, a BKS union that time. And uh, when the matter was uh, uh, escalated to my father's level, I said to him very clearly that, uh, you know, uh, you are not going to uh, yield. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how long this takes, but we are going to send the right signal, set the right precedent. And he backed us 100%. Now, how is the problem going to be solved? You know, the irresistible force has met the immovable object. So this is taken to Matoshri, to Balasaheb Thakre. So uh, all of us go there, the so-called management side and the so-called union side. And now we are all sitting in his antechamber and Bala Sahib is sitting there on his throne. Um, now what do you say? I mean, I asked ask myself then, what is it I would say to Bala Sahib Thakre, you know? Um, and what my father did was so smart. He, he didn't say anything else. He just said, here are the keys to the company. Aap hi manage kar lo. You know? So this uh, Sun Tzu's wisdom that the first step to victory is to put yourself out of the possibility of defeat. He did that for himself and for Balasaheb. Because there was no question of any confrontation. He's saying, aap chabi le lo, aap hi karkhana chalao. You know, which obviously he cannot, I mean, the other side cannot do. And for Balasaheb also, this was not offensive. Because here is somebody who is submitting actually to him. And uh, immediately it was agreed that uh, the, some people who had caused trouble, uh, they would be dismissed uh, from the service of the company because that would send the right signal, uh, you know, and, and uh, find a kind of permanent solution to the problem. But then, what my father did was to agree to give a auto rickshaw free to each of those people so that they could earn a livelihood from tomorrow, so that their family would not suffer, you know. So, A, it's about doing the right thing. but in the present context, in the present times we live in, whether you are in India or Ukraine, I would also say it's about doing the right thing with a human touch, with a human face, with grace. You know, you don't hurt someone. You do the right thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody has to be hurt at the end of the day. You know, so, so that, was, uh, uh, that was important. Um, so, so to answer your question, uh, A, from a business point of view, it means that you must be competitive. Uh, you can't compromise on that because otherwise you cannot survive. From a government point of view, it means that government must be supportive. If Bala Sahib Thakre had not supported us that day, uh, maybe Bajaj Auto would have you know, f uh, gone along a very different course, at least for some time. 
And thirdly, it also means, I suppose, that society must be progressive. You must understand that uh, uh, circumstances are bigger than you. Uh, and when things change, you have to adapt to that change. You can't expect the world to adapt to yourself. Uh, you know? So I think in this one problem, we can see so many facets of business, of government, of society. So I'll just ask you a rapid fire round because you know those are the kind of things that are very popular these days. Um, three words to describe your father and you get to have three each, not one each. Um, <laughs> I would say honest and caring, outspoken. That's three. No, honest and caring is one. Okay, fine. Really? <laughs> She's the youngest. She's outspoken allowed. Outspoken and passionate. Amazing. Okay. Courageous, compassionate, confident. So to make it memorable, the F in father for me, first of all stood for focus. This I will never forget. Secondly, for fearless. And third for fun, because as you said, he used to be the fun of parties and events and dinners and everything. So focus, fearless and fun. That's three words. But said in so many sentences. I didn't take so many sentences. So I, I got it right. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> all of you did well. Since I'm giving mark sheets over here, I'd give all of you A+. plus. We all get our coffee hampers. Yeah, you get your coffee hamper. Um, Thank you. So I just want to say thanks for making this Thank happen. Thank you, Aparna. Thanks Thank for you. making this happen. Thank it's you. a really special occasion. Really and. Great. And we'll remember a lot. Uh, and thank you to our audience for being here and for being with us on this really very, very special occasion. And we look forward to your support. Mm -hmm.